the the key things that I've been speaking about, and I think I Mark, I actually did the first webinar of this year. So to be at rounding off the year as well um, is great. And actually, in the last twelve months, there's been such a shift in the market. The talent scarcity is still there, but some of the critical pain points have shifted slightly. And I think the poll that Mark just shared really does show that. So. Candidate expectations really have risen and they are higher possibly than they've ever been. However, what we are finding and the feedback we're getting is that candidates are walking away more disappointed than they have been previously. So with that talent scarcity continuing and candidates feeling disappointed, there's a real heady mix about making sure that you're getting all of your interactions throughout your hiring funnel, correct, right down from the first interaction all the way through that hiring funnel. So today I'm just going to go through kind of how do you set the guidelines in the process? How do you set yourselves up for success, but also set your candidates up for success throughout your process? I'm going to jump in quickly to a case study that we have with a local authority client just to show not really the power of, of just using Olio, but the power of transforming your processes and really understanding the candidates that are coming through and how to adapt your process in order to be successful. I'm also going to touch on the role of talent, uh, talent pools, talent pipelining within your hiring process and the impact that that can have on delivering great candidate experience. And then I'll discuss a little bit around how can you continuously improve um, on, on what you're doing and how you're delivering your processes. So candidates are still being ghosted in 2023. And I think actually as a, as a candidate, we've all been there. You know, we, uh, we don't know where we are in the recruitment process. And that actually leads us to saying, you know what, I'm nervous about this organisation. So the rhetoric normally is our oh, candidates aren't bothered. There's so many jobs about they're just ignoring my calls. But a lot of the time it's because they don't understand where they are. Has their application been received? What is the, the number of interviews or tasks that they need to complete? When should they expect to hear? What was the feedback from the hiring manager in that interview process? There's a lot of uncertainty that actually is leading candidates to not contact or pick up the phone or respond to that email because it's come through after they expected it to. Their expectations have been missed, so they've decided to not continue with that organisation. So it's really critical as a talent acquisition professional to look at your process and say, are we able to communicate effectively, consistently and a really timely manner to our to our candidates that are in the process? And actually, are we, in fact, ghosting our candidates as opposed to them ghosting us? Now, for me. Getting candidate experience right starts right at the very beginning from that job description, from that job advert. So making sure that through your adverts and the language that you're using, you're able to attract the most diverse, high quality range of candidates as possible to your to your roles that you're hiring for. Making sure that you're using language that isn't going to put off female candidates is, is really key to making sure you get that broad range of candidates coming in. I think we've seen, you know, personal experience. I've actually seen this, you know, I've seen a job and I've thought, oh, my goodness, that sounds great. And then when I've dug into it, I've kind of thought, oh, I'm not quite sure how I feel about this organisation. Oh, I feel a little bit put off by some of the language that they've used in that. I'm not sure I'm the right match culturally for that organisation. So setting your stall out in a very clear and non-biased way right from that first interaction can make a difference to the candidates that are coming through. But I also want to touch on career sites. Now, a career site, I speak to organisations about career sites all the time and people talk about a lack of budget or I don't really know what a career site is going to do. For me, I feel like a career site is a great shop window for organisations. You know, an organisation is so much more than a workplace. An organisation is about a community of lots of diverse talent 
that are actually united by a shared vision? What are they all working towards? What is it about working at that organization that is great? What are the cultures? What are the values? Why as a candidate should I choose this organization? And a career site can really help to articulate that. A career site for me also can kickstart your candidate's engagement. It's an opportunity where you communicate your values, but equally you can showcase the roles that you have, what's been happening as an organization, what is your employee value proposition, what are your values and culture that can really entice them in. There might not be a role at that point that meets their skills, but by getting it right and pitching it right, you can encourage them to engage with you as an organization to become part of a talent pool. So you've got that talent sat there, you know their skills and their qualification for you to then engage with and build a relationship with them before there's even a role for them to apply for. Can really help you to track and understand who's coming into your talent pools, the type of talent that you're engaging with. So you can look at how you can potentially broaden that range of of workforce and, and candidates that are coming in. But critically, a strong career site can really help you to reduce that time to hire. By articulating clearly from the start what the roles are about, what the organisation stands for, you can bring you can bring candidates in more quickly and get them to apply much more readily than, than maybe they are today. One of the key areas on this slide for me, communication. And communication is something that I think every organization can struggle with, whether it's in their recruitment process or just generally internally, um, or whether, you know, it's how they're sending messages out about what they're up to. You know, it doesn't just happen to be in recruitment that organizations struggle with communication. So making sure that you're able to communicate in a really comprehensive and consistent way can make a huge difference in all of your processes. And it's not just about one stage, you know, they've applied, great, you've thanked them, you've told them that you'll be in touch. You have to do much more than that. You have to be transparent in the communication, what's happening. If there's a delay, let people know there's a delay. People are more likely to deal with that information positively if they're aware than if they just don't hear. Candidate experience is about not being an ostrich. Don't bury your head in the sand. Make sure that you're able to deliver those messages, good or bad, um, in a very consistent way and a transparent way. And that helps candidates to understand what they are going through and what is expected of them. Removing that mismatch of expectation that actually candidates are really struggling with. So how do you do that? Sitting there manually typing out emails is hugely time consuming. For me, it's all about how do you utilize data driven automation to really take away the burden of some of those communications? If a candidate's applied, how can get a system in place that can automatically send a response that's highly personalized? Thanks them. Thanks them, thanks them for their application and outlines what's going to be happening next. Are they going to be going through a screening process? Is there assessments? What does the interview process look like if they're successful? So in that first communication, you're managing those expectations effectively. But also making sure that you've got those touch points in a way that really means something to the candidate. If they're applying for a role, a project management role, make sure that the communications back to them are about that role, they're highly personalized and not always just generic. So make sure you've got flexibility in your tools to really help a candidate understand and feel like you care and they're highly valued right from day one. So if it wasn't enough, talent scarcity, rising candidate expectations, actually for the first time ever, we have five generations entering and working the work, uh, work within the workforce. So to ensure that you're able to effectively appeal to multiple generations, you really kind of have to understand how these generations differ. Now, I'm sure actually, if we looked at the the range of generations on on this call, we would probably cover three, maybe four of these generations. Um, You never know, we might have all five on here. Um, But actually, we all offer 
something different within the different stages of our career. So it's really about understanding those different perspectives and looking at how through your communications and your engagement, you're able to drive that through. So for example, boomers tend to be very process orientated and they're highly focused and enjoy teamwork, but they're also very loyal to, to the brands. They like the stability that big brands and big corporates can bring to them. Millennials tend to be highly tech driven and are very focused on how do I make an impact and how do I develop myself so I can continue to make an impact in what I'm working on. And then the latest generation, the Gen Zs that are entering, they tend to be very entrepreneurial in their approach. They have strong opinions, but they embrace change and new experiences in a way that other generations haven't done before. So making sure that when you're selecting where you're putting your roles, how you're advertising your roles, you're able to address with flexibility those differing needs is very clear. If you're able to get that right, you'll be able to develop a really innovative and sustainable workforce. So it's making sure that you're able to communicate transparently. You know, one of the key things for me is not just everything, not just on email or on social media. You know, how can you appeal to younger generations? Is there other social media you should use? Should you be using WhatsApp in some of your communications? Um, but have that transparency about flexibility. Is it a hybrid role? Is it fully remote? Is it in the office? But critically, what is the salary? If you're not advertising the salary within your role, you could be excluding an entire generation from applying for your roles. You know, Gen Z are very unlikely to apply for a role unless they understand the salary brackets that, that they're working to. So looking at how you can be as inclusive um, in terms of gender, equity, DEI, but also inclusive in terms of the generations um, that you're trying to bring into your organization, can really make sure you're matching expectations nice and early in that recruitment process. Now, another area where, for me, I feel that candidate experience and candidate expectations can be missed can be around. Um, the entire process you know screening can take a very long time if you've got thousands of applications for a role actually manual screening processes can take a long time and recruitment has always been super fast paced and it's only getting quicker and the expectation to be able to move super fast in the recruitment um a recruitment process isn't going anywhere so it's how can you shorten the time it takes to screen your candidates in a really proactive way so that candidates aren't dropping out and you're not missing out on that top, top, top talent. So looking at technologies where you can screen um, applications very quickly, you can pull skills out of CVs and resumes to identify that top talent. You can do on-demand interviewing to screen. So actually you're not reliant on hiring managers, um, calendars and availability um, or getting feedback after the event. You know, they they come on, they watch a, an on-demand video screening, they score there and then you've got that information much more readily. So you can keep that top talent within your processes. And making sure that you're focusing in on the candidates that are the most qualified, that are demonstrating the skills and behaviours that you're looking for is key to keeping that process moving really, really quickly. You know, avoiding bottlenecks is, is, is hugely um, important. So in terms of, uh, you know, overall process it's really really key that you start to look at the technology and identify um, your bottlenecks quickly and I will later on just talk about some of those key bottlenecks can, that can make a difference in your candidate experience but you know make sure you're clear with your hiring managers what the expectations are so that you can stop that ghosting and bring in that best talent you know 
making sure that you're automating as much within what the hiring manager needs to do so that they are able to focus on business as usual and still drive through that recruitment process. You know, I've, I've been on both sides of the fence. I've been the candidate. I've also been the hiring manager. And you don't mean to be late in giving feedback, but occasionally it happens. So actually, what are the tools you can bring in so that they give feedback in the moment rather than it being after the fact? And actually, their diary's just got too busy and it's dropped down their to-do list. Making sure that you're providing them with the data. This, these are the top candidates. And this is why we've done this. We've screened them all based on what you've asked for. Focus on these five rather than them looking at 30 or 40 CVs, which means candidates maybe are sat there for a week, maybe two weeks while they get, they get through those CVs. And make sure you're offering a really, really smooth process to your candidates. Keep them up to date. Define those touch points that are going to keep them engaged. And like I say, be open, be transparent if there is a delay, if the hiring manager is going on holiday or has to be out of the business suddenly. Make sure they're aware of that so their expectations are managed, so they understand and actually they appreciate the communication that's, that's coming through for them. That really helps to reduce uncertainty. And it can really prevent candidates just disappearing without notice because they feel informed and they know what's expected of them and when. Like I said, I'm just going to touch on uh, a case study here. Um, and this is with a local authority. So you can see on the slide, you know, up to 300 different roles, um, different job types that they, they were recruiting for, over 11,000 yearly applications um, with over 1,500 hires. So high volume, but diverse roles that they're, they're trying to bring into their organization. So actually a one size fits all kind of process probably isn't going to work for them. Oh, I keep jumping slides. I do apologize. I keep pressing it too many times this morning. I'm overly excited. Um, so, you know, they were looking for a solution that really was able to, to support them and bring a flexibility that they didn't have before. You know, they're utilizing tools such as the inclusive writing tool to make sure they're bringing in the most diverse range of candidates really helped them. Introducing a career site, that shop window, which was able to provide candidates with a snapshot of organizations of the organization. You know, they introduced videos like a day in the life of the different roles they were recruiting for. And that made a big difference to their application rates. But they were able to also look at the bottlenecks within their process and introduce a flexibility around screening. You know, what were the killer questions they'd had to ask to ensure the candidates were eligible right at the beginning? And what were the questions that could come later on in the process that were still needed, but they weren't the killer questions that were a yes, no in terms of eligibility? Made a real difference to them. And I will just touch on their... Um, I'll just touch on their results. Honestly, I'm having a nightmare with my mouse pad. Doesn't normally happen, so apologies. Um, but, you know, they were able to transform their positive candidate experience rating on over 11,000 applications to 100%. So by embracing technologies, they introduced blind screening to support their DNI objectives, and they were able to break their process down to really boost efficiencies in their screening, um, but by able, being able to communicate where the candidates were in the process made a huge difference to their candidate experience. And I think, you know, hitting 100% positive candidate rating is really key. And like I said, this is about how they made changes in their process in a really subtle way. So they understood what was happening and they were managing their candidate expectations from day one effectively. So I'm going to move on now and just really talk about talent pools and understanding and nurturing your candidates. So it gives me a chance to have a quick sip, sip of coffee. Um, we're just going to jump into the next poll. And this really is about do you use talent pools effectively?
I can see there's quite a lot of chat happening as well. So uh, <clears throat> I look forward to, to Mark reading these questions to me as well. Okay, cool. Okay, so quite quite a mixture there in um, talent pool usage, um, which is good. It's great to see that a few of you are now utilizing uh, talent pools, which is great to great to see. Um, yeah, and I can see that people are wanting to kind of understand how they can how they can manage them more effectively. So that's that's really good, really good. So hopefully this next part will be be highly relevant. Uh, to everyone so there's a few people there that kind of a bit like oh no i don't really use them not really sure what they're about so just before i kind of delve, delve into how you can create a strategy around talent pools and talent pipelining it's really key to articulate what a talent pool is so these pools are really curated groups of potential candidates that you believe possess the skills and qualifications align to your, your organizational needs globally. Um, and you can have multiple talent pools. You could have them by job family, as an example. So, you know, if you have, um, I don't know, lots of administration is probably an, a, an easy way to articulate a job family. So you may have a sales administrator, a marketing administrator, a finance administrator. So some of those core skills are similar but then there are some nuance in there. You could create a talent pool around candidates that have those skills. And it's important to, to think about talent pools as not just having to be uh, silver medalist candidates, those that have been in the process and maybe haven't been successful, but also think about having candidates that haven't yet applied, that demonstrate the skills that your organisation may need now in the midterm or in the longer term. So look at how you can engage with potential candidates, encourage them to share their skills and qualifications with you and to be part of your talent pools. You know, look at leveraging networking events or social media or industry partnerships to really grow that talent pool and to understand the range of talent that's out there. Now, one thing I will say is that, you know, trying to manage talent pools manually is hugely time consuming. So making sure you're looking to leverage technology that can help you with talent pool management. And by that, I mean looking at tools that can help you to pinpoint relevant candidates within your talent pools um, with the right skills that you're looking for when new roles um, become available, but also can help you to automate that communication. How do you nurture those candidates, keep them warm, keep them up to date with what's happening across the organisation, in the industry, um, within maybe the particular job family that they're, that, you know, they're working in. For example, if I look at product management, highly relevant to kind of my role at Olio, you know, within my talent pools, I'll be talking to them about chat gpt and the rise of chat gpt and the need to to kind of be upskilling yourself to understand the role of ai within product management so that you're able to to look at roles that maybe are more more deeply rooted down that down that area so making sure those you know those interactions are highly personalized and relevant but also hints and tips encourage them you know if they've done any more qualifications or they've done any courses or done any personal development such as attending webinars and things like that encourage them to keep their talent pools up to date and that's a really good way of keeping them warm keeping them engaged and keeping your brand front of mind you know they will feel like you care about them so making sure that you're proactive don't only contact your talent pools when you feel you have a relevant role Keep them up to date. Encourage them to look at maybe other roles where some of their skills match, but not all of them. So try and do some cross-pollination in there. That can really help to keep candidates engaged, potential candidates engaged, um, but also can help you to secure that, that top talent that you're looking for in a really positive and, and proactive way. So the key things around talent pools is make sure you can identify skills quickly, 
from the role that you're looking for and make sure that you're able to automate your communication so it's not on you as talent acquisition professionals to try and manually communicate all the time and look at how you generate that content because that is an area I will touch on I do appreciate that people will worry about how do we get content that's relevant all the time look at what's happening in the news share interesting articles um, from um, a blog that you've read uh, a thought leadership piece uh, what marketing sent out as a customer newsletter can you take some of that content and build that in to how you're communicating with them can you link to areas of your career site it doesn't always have to be new content but if it's relevant to those candidates and the skills then they're going to receive that in a really positive way you know as as human beings and uh we all tend to have this this tendency if something's bad we tell people about it so you know getting it wrong can be can be detrimental not communicating is never great even if it's bad news even if it's feedback that somebody hasn't got a role it's important they get that feedback they can learn from that and equally they respect that you've gone back to them to let them know that they weren't successful and why they weren't successful that helps them to grow and they will remember that interaction uh, and the politeness and the communication so if there is a role that comes up in the future they may still be interested because they had a really good experience with you and equally, if you get this right and you communicate really openly and candidates feel like they know exactly where they are, they're going to tell their friends. They're going to encourage their friends to apply for roles at the organisation. So you can start to build talent pools and build referrals by making sure you get that communication process right as well. So the last point um, I'm going to talk on today is continuous improvement strategies. Um, as I said right at the beginning, you know, I work in products, so we're always about iteration. How do we understand what's happening? How do we move forward? How do we change and adapt based on changing needs? Or, you know, we need to update functionality. It needs to go slightly further than it did before. And actually, the same is true within recruitment and, and processes. So making sure you understand your data from operational day-to-day -day data all the way through to that strategic reporting, you know, whether that's DE&I reporting um, to, I don't know, trends in, in um, application flows or trends in roles coming to the market, you know, really understanding that data can make a difference to your process throughout. Making sure you can identify those bottlenecks um, everybody has them, nobody wants them, but they do happen from time to time. It could be screening, it could be uh, interview availability, it could be at acknowledging applications, it could be anywhere through your process. But by understanding that data, you're able to make those positive changes in what you need to, to drive that forward and to manage candidate expectations more effectively than you can today. For me, data-driven recruitment is, is key to, to, to driving forward and driving changes. Um, you know, I firmly believe that if you're able to embrace technology, you really can streamline processes. Um, and by driving and believing and fostering transparent communication, that really can have a knock-on effect to some of those key markers and KPIs that you have within um, talent acquisition teams you know it really can help you to save time it really can help you to screen more quickly um, but it can also remove a huge amount of frustration with poor communication talent being ghosted top talent ghosting you you know it really is about making recruitment a seamless and positive experience not just for candidates but for you as recruiters as well, if you've got a process that works really smoothly, you're able to fact, fact, focus and factor in those elements that you really want to be doing, those human connections, building those relationships with those candidates. That's key. Everybody still wants those real personal touches. So automating other areas will free you up to focus on that and let you be the best recruiters that you can possibly be rather than being 
weighed down with admin. The war on talent, I think I, yeah, right at the beginning of the year, I spoke about this and I, I had a slide where I said, I just really don't see this going away within the next 12 months. And I really don't think it has. I think some of the challenges have, have changed around the world, war on talent, but actually that scarcity is still there. So making sure that you've got a very collaborative and proactive approach will make the dis difference. And understanding the landscape of your individual industry is going to be key to making a difference. And I can see quite a few questions coming in on screening. So I will I will jump into into that in um, in a moment for you. But before I do just a little bit about who are Olio. Uh, Mark touched on this at the beginning. So we're an end-to-end -end ta talent acquisition platform. Um, and we really believe that recruitment isn't a one-size-fits-all and organizations need real flexibility within the solutions that they have today. And we're really proud to offer to market a highly flexible solution that has data-driven automation and recruitment at its heart. So we're always looking at ways of how we can help you understand what's happening in your process and to streamline that, freeing you up to be the best recruiters that you can be. I touched on us working with local authority within that case study, but here's just a few of the customers that we that we work with today. So there's a really broad range of organisations that actually all have a very unique set of challenges within their sectors. Mm -hmm.